Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. We've mentioned NASA on the show many times before, and I have even had email contact with Robert Manning, an engineer who is ostensibly the chief engineer on the Mars Curiosity program. He agreed to answer technical questions about the mission, but then ran away from my questions when it seemed he could not answer them, affirming the phrase that NASA stands for, never a straight answer. If you don't believe what I have just said, then please watch this lecture from the link on the screen, which includes evidence that Curiosity may not be situated on Mars and could be in the Canadian Arctic. I am joined today by somebody who has also had communication with NASA, albeit in a slightly more surreptitious method. I'd like to welcome onto Rich Planet, Gary McKinnon. Welcome, Gary. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for having me on. All right, then. Um, I think a large number of uh, my viewers will know who you are already and, and have the outline uh, of your story, um, which we will go through the, the basic points of today. Yep. Um, and it started with an interest in, in UFOs. Uh, can you tell us first, uh, when did your interest in UFOs start? Um, UFOs specifically, well, I was always into stars. Apparently, even when I was three years old, I was always asking about the stars and stuff. So I was always looking at the sky from a young age. Your interest in UFOs goes back a long way, and I've not heard this on mainstream TV before, mm -hmm. right back to the age of when you were 12. Yep. So tell us about that. Um, my stepfather, because my parents split up when I was six and we moved down from Glasgow to London. Uh, my stepfather was an avid science fiction fan, um, so I suppose that's what really got me into all that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, science fiction, you get interested in aliens and UFOs and the possibility of life in outer space and contact with other beings is probably one of the most exciting things we can imagine, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so I then joined Bufora, the British UFO Research Association, when I was about 12. It was, a, it was a subscription based thing and you got a, a monthly newsletter if I remember rightly, it was a long time ago now. Right, um, right. Yeah. Alright, so how did you find out about the Disclosure Project? Well obviously having an interest in UFOs, when the internet came to Britain in the mid 90s, mm. uh, an incredible resource for UFO information. And um, so after a while you do stumble across the, well actually I was already interested in just finding out stuff, but then was it 2000 or 2001? 2001 was the conference. The, the that's, that's what really got me going, that conference. Right. To me, that was mind-blowing, all these high-level witnesses. You know. Right, because it, it wasn't widely publicised. No. So how, how did you know about it when it, when it came about? Um, I think someone else told me. Right. Um, and they told me before it was actually, before the event took place. Mm -hmm. But I, remember, I think I'm right in remembering at the time, they had uh, some kind of broadcast failure as well. Right. Um, so it didn't reach the sort of multicast internet audience that they hoped it would at the time. Okay. Yeah. So that was your inspiration to try and find out more, the, the Disclosure mm. Project, or one of the pieces of inspiration. So I, I gather it was after the Disclosure Project conference that you got sort of caught red-handed with your computer-related activities. Yeah. Um, were you involved in computer-related activities uh, before the Disclosure Project, or was it, or was that the... Uh, that, that was... That was the instigator to right. having a look, right. <laughs> if I can call it that. All right, so, so can yeah. you just tell us how you went about trying to find out information that you thought was being kept secret? Yep, um, part of the, one of the Disclosure Project witnesses is uh, Donna Hare, and um, she was working at Johnson Space Center at NASA. Uh, she had secret clearance. She was a, a photographic sort of mission launch specialist. Mm -hmm. And um, she said that one day when she was working in Building 8, so she actually mentioned the building of uh, Johnson Space Center, JSC, um, there was a colleague who was in another room, but they all, they all had secret clearance, but they were on different projects. Mm -hmm. And um, she was in this chap's lab or room, whatever it is, and he said to her, come and take a look at this. You know, what do you think this might be? And um, he showed her a picture of uh, a large white disk, uh, presumably a satellite photograph, uh, above the Earth, but not very high above the Earth because there was um, a shadow on the trees, which Donna Hare didn't spot at first. And being a, a photographic expert, she said, well, is that a blob in the emulsion? That's her first professional thought. And the guy said, blobs in the emulsion don't cast circular shadows. And uh, she basically said that he told her his entire lab was to do with airbrushing out UFOs from high res satellite imagery from NASA because they're so preponderant mm -hmm. around the planet. 
Right, and the, she gave the name of the building that she was working in. Building 8. Building 8. Mm. So, <coughs> um, just tell us then technically how you went about trying to access in information like that. Yeah. Um, well, I was already on Johnson Space Center, you know, in terms of my illegal presence there, uh, because they ran Windows. Um, they were running something called NetBIOS over the internet. NetBIOS is a, an office protocol, basically, for Windows. It's very insecure. There's no way you should be running that open to the internet. So it was very easy to get in. And um, So I'll just interrupt you there, Gary. So you, you would need the IP address that's running the NetBIOS initially to try and uh, request data from it, yeah? Yeah. So, you so, so, so how did you find the IP address of Building 8 or, or whatever system you were, you were okay. trying to access? Yeah. Well, you can, um, you can. That's publicly available, is it? Oh yeah, there's, there's online services where you can you can type in, you know, Johnson Space Center, or the network name, which I think was JSC-NASA.gov, and uh, they give you the whole IP block that they own. Right. And somewhat stupidly, uh, NASA, just like the military and everyone else, wasn't using non-routable uh, internet addresses, like which are safe for offices because they're they're private. You know, mm. what I mean. So this is what you call an internet-facing IP address yeah. on a desktop computer? Um, is that yeah, the desktop computers, the main servers. So there was obviously. no firewall at all? It's as if, so you could ping the computers yep. in NASA on a desk from your own router? Yeah, some of them wouldn't ping, but I'd still probe them just in case they didn't reply to pings, but they were still live machines. Right. So you, you, you gained access to a whole raft of, of computer systems within... Well... W w w can I ask you, was it just NASA? Oh no, they're all like this. Um, that, that was, I used that one single method mm -hmm. to gain entry to the places I got into. Right, and are you allowed to say which other places you got into? Or well, I'll say it was, it was the Army, the Navy and NASA and the Pentagon. Right, the right. And are they, were they all on separate banks of IP addresses, each of those that you've just mentioned? Oh yeah, yeah, completely separate blocks. Right, yeah. so you knew you, whether, you were, whether you were trying to access NASA or Pentagon or Army, Navy, they're all in completely different IP ranges. Yeah, yeah, but right. once you're in there, it can better get a bit confusing because once you start exploring, there's attached networks, other networks, private networks, and in the end, you're not really sure where you are after a while. But Right, uh, all right, so it was, it was quite comprehensive, this sort of amount of access that you had. And I've heard you say that there were other people there who also do oh. what you were doing. And, and would you say that you were one of the more, more prolific pers people doing that? Did you get an impression or, or would you not be able to say? I can't say because I don't know what they were doing, but um, I did a simple command because when, when you're on there, at first I was using the command line interface, so it's just a black box. And, uh, but you do a command on Windows called netstat, and you can see all the other connections to the same machine. And then you can look up for those IP addresses and think, well, God, they're from China, they're from Denmark, they're from Turkey. It's like the whole world was in these machines. And I knew that was wrong, because there's no way people from all over the world should be on NAS machines. Mm -hmm. So they must have all been unwelcome guests like I was. Right, so what period of time from when you first accessed the first uh, system to when you got arrested, what sort of, what's the duration we're talking? Oh, like 18 months, two years. Right, mm -hmm. all right. So you, you d did you have any feeling at the time that you might get collared for this at all? No, because I thought, initially, I mean, the security so lax anyway. Um, I thought, well, if, if it's that easy to get in, then they probably aren't monitoring properly. Right, so. right. all right. So let, let's um, talk about what you saw before we go on to then what happened with the arrest and everything. Yeah. Um, <coughs> how long was it before you saw anything that, of any sort of significance? Oh, a long time. Right. Um, you know, months and months. Uh, so did you not get bored with it, or was it always keeping your fascination with what, what kept you going back if you didn't get anything for, for months and months? Oh, the promise of possibly finding something. Right. And, the, and the fact it was so easy, and I thought at some point this is going to close the store and they'll stop running NetBIOS over the internet. Right. And you won't be able to find blank passwords so easily. Right. And every time you, you were in uh, communicating with a particular IP, online IP address, did, would you always know which building you were accessing computers from? No, not at all. Not, not the physical building. Right. No, no. Right. All right, so just tell us um, when you got your first hit, if you like, as regards actually seeing something interesting. The first thing was, was documentation. Um, I used a program called Land Search, I think, that once you had this control over the domain, um, because you'd get control of domain controllers, so you, you own the whole network, basically. 
and uh, land search could actually search all the files and folders on every machine. And obviously it's hard because things aren't going to be called secret UFO data dot PDF, are they? Mm. So, um, but I'd scan and look for documents, et cetera, et cetera. And I found an Excel spreadsheet that was actually called, or at least in, in the heading of the column, it said non-terrestrial officers. And I was like, my bloody God, that's just Non-terrestrial officers. Non-terrestrial officers with um, ranks and names. Mm -hmm. And uh, then a separate sheet uh, with tabs for material transfer between ships. And these were, I mean, I don't remember the names now. It's, you know, it's a long time ago. A lot of people give me a hard time for not remembering the names and stuff, but it was a long time ago. Right. But uh, non-terrestrial officers thought, well, it must be, let's try and cut out all the possible um, conventional explanations first. I searched for that term. It was nowhere. It was right. nowhere at all. Now, if you search for the term, you only find links to me and right. stuff that I've said. Right. right, I see, I see. So it wasn't a standard thing in the military at all. Right. Um, so I took that to be, they must have a space-based, a secret space-based... So the non-terrestrial officers, what, it couldn't be astronauts? It could be. I mean, that, that's the thing, it's up to you how you interpret that, isn't it? Right. But these ships were called USS whatever and USS whatever. So they started with USS? Yeah, so that, that implies Navy, and I think the Navy, the Navy do a lot of space stuff, right. the US Navy. And, and so how many officers' names would, would you estimate were listed, and how many ships mm. were listed? Probably, oh God. I think there's probably one screen full of officers' names. So what's that, 25 rows? Right, on Excel okay. spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And these were low-resolution days as well. So you're talking yeah. about 800 by 600 screens, so not very big. Uh, but the ships was probably, I don't know, a third of the spreadsheet. So estimate how many different ship names you saw? Oh, God, maybe eight, ten. Eight or ten. Yeah. And d am I right in thinking that you then tried to search for those specific names? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, and... Didn't find a thing. Right, yeah. so you think that they could be classified. Not, not the names of the people, the names of the ships. Yeah, yeah. but they could be classified uh, secret or top secret names of s some sort of craft or ship. Yeah, obviously not public. Right. So. All right, and Gary, well, we'll continue this uh, after the break. Welcome back. I'm talking to Gary McKinnon about um, when he accessed NASA computer systems and found some very interesting information on there. Uh, I've given lectures, Gary, about uh, the TR-3B, and in those lectures, this, this is an alleged secret aircraft, uh, and in those lectures I've sort of put forward the case that it's not really NASA that's possibly uh, designed that technology, that it's maybe the, the, uh, some secret part of the Air Force and the NSA that is, is controlling the information. This comes from Edgar Fouché, a whistleblower. Right. And th that NASA are, or at least publicly, predominantly put on display rockets. I don't think there's anything more advanced propulsion-wise th than a rocket. Mm. So, d d what are your feelings on that? What, what do you, do you th the fact that you've you've been into a NASA establishment uh, systems and you're finding non-terrestrial officers? So I'm putting the question: d d Don't you think there would be somewhere else like the NSA? Well, um, the non-terrestrial officers, I think, was on a Navy system. Right. Did, did, did I say that earlier? I think I did. Oh, that wasn't in NASA? No, that was on a Navy system. Right, I see. If I remember rightly, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Right, okay. So, that, so the non-terrestrial officers uh, spreadsheet, that wasn't in a NASA building, you don't think? No, no. All oh, right, that was in the Navy. Yeah. Right, okay. Uh, and in, the, in the, um, the actual ships as well, you mentioned there was names of ships. That, yeah. was, that was Navy as well. Yeah, so that had spreadsheet. Right, so that, that wasn't in a NASA folder in, in Building 8 in... No. Right, no. I see. All right, so that's, that could explain the, the question that I've just asked there. So just to stay on this sidetrack, w what are your feelings on the, on the Apollo missions? <laughs> do, 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 you, do you buy into the, we never went to the moon, or do you have a strong position, or are you open-minded? What, what's your... Um, I think when you think about things like the Van Allen belts and the radiation um, and the film on the cameras, uh, the battery on the module, there's a lot of you know, solid scientific reasons why it was impossible with the technology back then. Right, right. All right. Well, e even the computer power back then makes me slightly suspect. Right. But all right, well, you've answered that question. So you mentioned, you mentioned Donna Hare before, whose colleague was involved in airbrushing UFOs out of NASA images. Mm. And this allegedly took place in Building 8 
at the Johnson Space Centre? That's it? right. Right. Yeah. So you accessed computer systems there. Tell me what you found. Right. Because Donna Heron said it was building eight, uh, when you're in the command line interface and you type in NetStan, Windows has a, a function where when you list all the machines on the network, there's a comment field. And NASA had used a comment field uh, for standard computer audit information that said this isn't building blah, that, you know, this is the serial number, et cetera, et cetera. So finding building eight was surprisingly easy, mm -hmm. surprisingly easy. And uh, so then I scanned that subnet, so I think it was only 255 machines on the subnet for building eight. And um, there they were, these, all these machines with blank administrator passwords. It was, it was as if when they'd built the network, they'd used an image and blatted out the image to every machine because every single machine had a blank administrator password. Mm -hmm. An administrator gives you full control, so it's, it was a ridiculous. In building at the Johnson Space Center, I found out there were files, sorry, folders, called uh, raw and filtered or processed and unprocessed. And these files were like 200 odd megabytes, you know, 250 megabytes. They were in a, a proprietary NASA format. And um, this is in the days of 56K dial-up, so you, know, you couldn't download them in like five minutes. And uh, I wanted to you know, get on there, find out what I could, and get out quickly. And so I had remote control of the desktop using a program called Remotely Anywhere. And um, so if you double-clicked on an image, their proprietary software came up, and the image was there. But it wasn't there like that, because it's a slow connection. Um, I turned it down to, I think, two-bit or four-bit color. I can't remember if it was monochrome or just four, four bit color. And uh, it started, you know, juddering down the screen. I think remotely anywhere, anywhere was a Java app at the time. And I uh, only got to see about half or two thirds of it or something. But it was a hemisphere of a planet, which I assume was Earth, because it was blue and it was cloudy. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it was a, a classic cigar shape uh, with, you know, no seams, no rivets, no sort of workmanship on the outside. But it did have one sort of human looking thing which was the sort of geodesic domes that you see at Men With Hell. Um, above and below, to the left and the right, and one you know, on its nose, and I assume, sorry, one on this side, and I assume one on the other side as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, some people say that could have been man-made because of that geodesic dome feature, um, but the fact of, it all flowed in. There was no, there's the tube, and there's a socket for the dome. Mm -hmm. you know? It was all a flowing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but that's when I saw someone else the mouse moved, right-clicked on the LAN icon, disconnect, and boom, all was gone. When you saw that particular image, d did that then lead to your arrest? Yeah, because um, when they disconnected me, they obviously got my IP address, because I was doing a direct connection, foolishly, at that time, because I was getting lazy or cavalier. And uh, it was NASA that contacted BT and about the IP address. Then you get the client's address through the police, UK police. So that was, that's what got me caught. Right. Yeah. So that then started, uh, well, how many, how many years was the, was the legal battle going on? Nearly 11 years, from March 2002 till October 2012. So the first you found out about it was you got a knock at the door. Yeah. So just <laughs> explain what happened on that day. Crikey. Um, I'd, I'd stopped doing the hacking, if you can call it that, you know, blank password phishing. And um, I think I'd been playing this PC game called Galactic Civilizations <laughs> all night till about three o'clock. So I'd only been asleep for a few hours. And uh, next thing I know, there's someone saying, Gary McKinnon, Gary McKinnon, <laughs> and following right. me. And I woke up to find uh, a detective, whatever he was, from the National High Tech Crime Unit, saying you're under arrest for, well, I assume he said hacking into NASA. I can't right. really remember now. Right. And, and, and so. Did they take you away from your home then? No, the first thing they did was a, a massive search. They searched my girlfriend, they searched me, um, they searched the house, they took away the computers, not just the hard drives, they took away all the computers. I was fixing computers for people as well, they took away all of those. <laughs> yeah. Right, so did they give you them back? Oh, oh yeah, um, after a long time. I got back my friends' machines and clients' machines that I was fixing, I got them back within a few months. But I only got my... Oh no, I've not, I've no, they, they never gave me back my hard drives because they had right. evidence on them. Right, so you um, never got them back? No, no, right. because I didn't get time to get a copy of the image, but I got a copy of the non-terrestrial officer spreadsheet, right. which was on my hard drive, uh, which was encrypted, uh, but uh, I stupidly told them the password. I just fessed up to everything when I got caught, because right. they said, oh, you'll only get six months, or so probably not even that, you'll get community service, you know, you'll be fine. 
So that spreadsheet that we discussed earlier <coughs> was on the hard drive that was confiscated from yeah. you, and you've never seen it again. No, which I'm is still trying to get it back. Right, so, which is why you so can't uh, remember the names, because, yeah. because you thought you had it stored on your hard drive, yeah. right? Um, all right, so, so as you said, initially they said to you, oh, you'll get some community service or something mm -hmm. like this. So why did, why did that then turn into an extradition request and a threat for 60 or 70 years in prison? How did that progress from mm. up, up the chain? Well, what happened, the NHTCU officers went to Washington and um, when they came back from Washington, um, they'd obviously been extremely impressed by talking to the top brass over there. Who'd obviously said, yes, very serious case. He's a very dangerous man. Uh, just like the this is the Americans said this. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I'm assuming because the officers came back with a completely different attitude. No longer was it six months or community service. Now it was a very serious thing. You know? Right. So they arrested you. They were quite okay with you. Confiscated your stuff. Then they went out to America yep. to speak to whoever, mm. and then they've come back with a completely different attitude. Yeah, and gave me a second interview. Right. And because um, I didn't have a lawyer present at my first interview. And I just admitted, yeah, because I knew it was all on the hard drive, where it'd been. Because I'd, I'd kept files and stuff, you know. Um, so there was no point in saying, no, I didn't do it. Um, so I assumed I should have had a lawyer at first, and it might not have gone on for so long, who knows. But uh, I had a lawyer at the second interview, and uh, they were trying to uh, get me on conspiracy, saying, oh, we saw some of your ICQ chat logs, and we think you may have been working with other people, which I wasn't. And um, I said, well, no. But I had chatted to people about what I was doing, but I didn't involve anyone else at all. Right. Um, and it was then they started saying, well, it's very serious, you know, it could be a long jail term, the Americans, you know, really want you bad. There's a lot of pressure from Washington on uh, right. Downing Street or whatever. And, and w were they trying to twist it and say that you'd actually um, caused damage, even though you were just maintaining a silent presence? Well, this is the thing, there was, um, it wasn't until I actually saw the, the American charge sheet where they listed, you know, all the supposed damage. Um, so. I don't think the NHTCU mentioned damage to me at first, but they, they kept on calling it attacks and targets. And I said, can you please not use that language? Because it wasn't an attack. I was in there and I was looking around, but I wasn't attacking, I wasn't vandalizing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, but in order to get the extradition, do they not have to prove that you've done damage? Can they extradite you just based on the fact that you're looking at stuff? This is the thing, they don't need any proof. They just need the accusation and they need to get your name and address right and they can take you over there. Right. As has happened to countless people since me. Right. So. Right. All right. The Americans have come down quite heavy handed saying they want you extradited and the British authorities are going along with that initially. Is that right? Well, no, because um, the initial arrest was March 2002 and um, the, ex the full ratified extradition request uh, didn't come through till 2005 because our, our laws. We didn't have this special UK-US extradition treaty in place. We were still going off the 1989 extradition treaty, right. which required good evidence right. for the accused offence. So they, we think they tactically waited. We think they may even have made this law, or certainly included my case in the formation of the law, because even some of the wording of the new treaty, and the spelling was American mm -hmm. in this UK-US treaty. It was right. American spelling, ridiculous. So they waited uh, until 2005, I think it was, to present it fully. And uh, I'd got my first job in a few years because I, I, I couldn't work in IT anymore, obviously, because everyone thought, oh, hands off for a while. And uh, I got my forklift license, was working in a warehouse. Mm. And um, I got a phone call from my lawyer at work. And she said, they, they want to extradite you. You're going to stand trial in America. And that just flabbergasted me, absolutely flabbergasted me. Uh, my journalist coming around to the warehouse where I was working. My landlord threw him out of my flat. And already the first time when I'd been arrested, I lost a lot. I lost my long-term girlfriend and the place I was living in, and here it was happening all again. All right, and Gary, we'll continue this very fascinating discussion after this break. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm talking to Gary McKinnon about the fact that he accessed NASA computers and other defense establishment computers in America and witnessed.